Several recent national polls have revealed startling results. The clear majority of Americans believe that there is intelligent life on other planets. But don't people really want to know what it is these aliens have to say? That's what we're going to talk about on today's edition of What's Really Happening? The talk show that brings much needed relief from Rush Limbaugh and is the perfect antidote to Howard Stern. Your hosts, Joseph and Todd, claim to represent a group of aliens sent by God who have authored a 2,000-page communication to humanity. Today's topic, the five alien missions to Earth, which were approved by the universe government. After their discussion, Joseph and Todd will be taking your calls. Now, here's Joseph and Todd. Good evening and welcome to this edition of What's Really Happening. I'm Todd. And I'm Joseph. And we welcome you to tonight's show. And Joseph, uh, as you and I travel around this country and meet all of these people that we are in contact with about this particular message, they always, first of all, want us to elaborate on why it's here, what it contains, the highlights, and kind of putting a 2,000-page message in a nutshell. Can you do that and review for the listener exactly what this message, why it's here, why it's in literal form, and then elaborate, if you could, a little bit more about the messages that have preceded it. Well, I think the original intent of the aliens that brought the message here in the 20th century uh, wanted to make us feel like this was a friendly universe and not a universe with a wrathful God and, and angry celestial personalities who wanted to prosecute you if you made so-called sins. Uh, I think this message was intended to liberate us from the fear of hell. Ancient religions and superstitious religions have always baited men with fear. This is a message of faith. This is a message of eternal life. This is a liberating message which, which explains to us that the eternal conflict is between fear and faith. And this 2,000 pages of alien information gives us the background information and the clarification of history to enable us to have this faith in what they say is an eternal life of interplanetary reincarnation. When you talk about this revelation in the Father trying to liberate us from the fear of death, the liberate us from the fear of a wrathful God, that was more or less put into place by what the aliens deem was the fourth revelation, uh, which was Jesus. Exactly. The aliens know him as Michael of Nebadon. He is the ruler of the entire universe of Nebadon. And in order to gain sovereignty of his universe, he had to come to his lowest physical creation. And Earth is that. And he has 3.8 million other inhabited worlds. But because of the degree of difficulty of living on this primitive world, he came here to prove his mettle and to gain sovereignty of the whole universe. And as you know, you know what they did to him. And so this time, the aliens decided to send a book. It's safer. You can't kill a book. And so we have the book, and we want our audience to read it because it can change the way you see the world. Uh, this book basically is a written message designed to elevate the people, in effect, and become the personification of the message. I assume that's correct. That's absolutely correct. This is a revelation from God that all those who read it get to participate in it and become the revelation. As you said, all the other revelations were in personality form. This one is in book form with the hope that personalities who read it will triumph over fear and then do the will of the Heavenly Father who sits uh, at the center of all creation according to the aliens and shares his love and power with all of his sons and daughters. And this book portrays us as members of a great royal family, a true royal family, not one of earth origin but of eternal origin, the family of God. And this is what the book portrays reality as, and it shows that once we, its main message is that of eternal life. It is the most soothing and comforting message because most earthlings fear death. All around them is living and dying. So really the most essential element of belief system in this book is the belief in eternal life. It is not a life where we just go right to heaven. We have to earn heaven, according to the aliens. We must traverse 570 worlds in an effort to perfect our personality so that we may actually appear in front of the living God. As it stands right now, the journey to heaven after this life is merely a myth. 
This message is the fifth of the five important missions that have come to this planet. Obviously looked at uh, Jesus in, in this message being the fourth and the fifth, respectively. Elaborate on the first three that came and what they meant and, and what, they, what type of setup they were to the uh, latter two. Jesus came, of course, to us approximately 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years before his birth, a celestial professor in the name of Machaventa Melchizedek also arrived in the same area of the earth in a place called Salem, which it later became Jerusalem. And he was the professor of the father of the Jews, Abraham. He, he made a deal with Abraham. He said, Abraham, you want a son? I'll give you a son, but you've got to do two things. You've got to teach one God, and you've got to teach my people that this God does not like the shedding of blood. And so Abraham, because he wanted a successor so badly, made this agreement with uh, Melchizedek, and this belief in monotheism and what it did for the Jewish people is the reason why Jesus selected the Jews for the stage of his appearance, because they at least believed in one God, an essential element of his belief system and teaching system. And then Melchizedek is, is in the scriptures in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus, of course, is the uh, basis of the New Testament. Also, as well, the second revelation to this uh, planet, or at least the second mission that came from these aliens, designate Adam and Eve as the second mission to this planet. Explain a little bit on why they were here, what they were doing here, and oh, their overall objectives. I think the most important revelation of the Adam and Eve mission to the average person on this planet, they think that Adam and Eve were the first two human beings. Uh, that couldn't be more untrue. Adam and Eve came here, according to the alien message, 38,000 years ago. There have been what we call human beings on this planet for almost a million years. So the Adam and Eve mission was not to bring the first two people to this world. It was to biologically uplift this world from its state at the time. At the time they came, human beings were about four foot tall and semi-savage. It would be a compliment to uh, the humans of that time. And so Adam and Eve came as role models and biological uplifters. And that was their mission. And, uh, of course, uh, Eve was a biological scientist. And she, in an effort to accelerate uh, physical evolution, she decided to mate with one of the higher types of one of the neighboring tribes. Although this was scientifically uh, would have been progressive, it was not in accordance with the will of the Father in heaven. And so they were cast from the Garden of Eden, and their mission also failed miserably. However, they did leave behind them enough genetic remnants from the royal blood strains to create the great Greek civilization and many other great civilizations of humankind. So a fraction of their mission, and that's what the listener has to understand out there, is a fraction of their mission was complete. Just so happens that they didn't complete all of it because they ate of what was deemed ultimately the forbidden fruit. Correct. So. It, it wasn't an apple at all. It was, uh, it was the fidelity of Eve that was at stake. And as many people do on this planet, they are subdued by the temptations of the flesh and uh, consequently violate the will of the Heavenly Father. Go on uh, to the first revelation, the mission to this planet uh, from the aliens, and that was Caligastia. Explain what happened, and especially being the first, it obviously was uh, an important mission for the aliens. Caligastia was our first planetary prince. Prior to his arrival, we had not seen any celestial visitors from the galaxies beyond. Caligastia brought 100 volunteers, each from a different world. They literally brought the wisdom of the universe to Urantia. And their mission was primarily designed to turn man from a hunter, which he was then, into a herder with the hope that he would one day become a peace-loving family farmer. Because they did teach that working with the soil is our highest blessing. And so they went about doing this for some 300,000 years and created many of the great institutions that we now take for granted. Uh, the whole concept of, of men and women living together in a home was, was created by these aliens. The, the alphabet, uh, we didn't come up with all this. They taught this to us, so food preservation, the domestication of animals. These techniques were all brought to a very barbaric world by a group of very high creatures working for the Heavenly Father. They succeeded in their mission for 300,000 years, but the system sovereign, the one who ruled this system of inhabited worlds, 619 inhabited worlds, his name was Lucifer. 
And because he had never seen the Father in heaven, he rebelled. And he took many of his planetary princes with him. And unfortunately, on this world, our planetary prince, Caligastia, threw in his lot with the traitorous insurgents and led Urantia back into the primitive days. And so after teaching that there was a God and that he was the center of the universe and should be the center of their lives, he taught that for 300,000 years. Then all of a sudden, with the conspiracy of Lucifer and the arch rebels, he began teaching that he was God. So uh, that was the mission of uh, Caligastia. He defaulted and, uh, well, let, let's say this, that uh, this is not an ordinary occurrence in this universe. In fact, in Jesus' universe of 10 million worlds, there has only been two other rebellions. Of course, we, we rebelled and we remain quarantined from the universe broadcasts. And that's why uh, many of us are ignorant of what's really happening. And that's why this alien message informs us as to what's really happening. And that's a great way to wrap it up. We have reached the point where we're going to have to take a break and get some word in from our sponsors. We will be back, uh, and when we return, not only taking some of your calls, but also going to get into what the alien message says about men and women. Can they ever get along? We'll be back. Hang on. Welcome back to What's Really Happening. And at the break, uh, Joseph, we left him with a little tease. Uh, can men and women ever really get along? And what this alien message has to say about the relationships between males and females, an age-long question that has been asked by many generations and many different cultures, all of which have their opinions. This alien message states that monogamy is ultimately the ideal, a man and a woman living together in a monogamous situation, raising a family, raising children. Elaborate for the listener a little bit more, Joseph, on the role that uh, that Adam, I mean, basically it started according to this alien message that Adam and Eve was the example, was the ideal off the front end. Adam and Eve uh, was the model family. That's why it was so tragic that they defaulted. They taught uh, the living of uh, what, what you say, the family plan, basically. And although that seems commonplace to us now, that was a real revolution in living. I mean, remember 38,000 years ago when these aliens came, human beings were living as tribal units and monogamy was the furthest thing from their minds. And so uh, it, was a, it was a long stretch for Adam and Eve, but it was the first time when Adam and Eve appeared as the world's rulers together on a podium ruling together, it was the first time in the long, long historical struggle of women that they had equal footing with men. And that is one of the main messages that uh, Adam and Eve taught, that women have an equal responsibility in the home and the family, and that they should have equal say-so. This was a revolution of thinking on this planet, because women were treated like uh, property at that time. And so it was a rejoiceful, jubilant time for women. And these two went so far as to say that women were the spiritual leaders of mankind. Quotes that in the book verbatim. Sure. You bet. So if you look at the, uh, the relationships between males and females of what it says uh, in this revelation, it also says that uh, the ideals are monogamy. The ideals are pair marriage. The ideal is uh, a male and a female raising children in the home together under one roof. Uh, but like the message says, all of these things are true. Yes, this is the ideal. But on the other hand, we are different. We're two distinct varieties of the same species living in close and intimate association. And it was designed that way. We were not designed to be alike. We were designed to be different and complementary. We are dual origin creatures. We were meant to work together with a creature who was unlike us but had certain talents and abilities that we didn't have as, as males and females. And this complementary relationship is what is supposed to lead to harmony. But at this stage of evolution, even the best of our male-female relationships are many times characterized by personal antagonism. And it will be that way all the way till paradise. We will never, uh, these aliens tell us, don't try to completely understand the opposite sex because you never will. Like you said, two varieties of the same species living together. And, and elaborating a little bit more on your point as far as antagonisms are concerned, it's obvious that this universe works in a duality to night and day, uh, white and black. There's all these different uh, dualities. You have Everyone male. has two angels, one a recorder, one a server. It's always this dual, dual function. Of course, the duality, along with that agitation, 
is what makes the relationship between male and female so spontaneous and so beneficial to mankind. It is so difficult, but also it's the ideal, it's the important thing to do in this world, according to this alien message, is to form a partnership between males and females and raise family, but it also indicates the truth in how difficult it is. And with that, we'll break and, uh, and take some of your calls. In fact, uh, we've got a full phone line, Joseph. We need to get to the phone lines. We have a call on line three. Uh, Janet from San Diego, welcome to What's Really Happening. Hi, Joseph, Todd. Are you guys serious? How do you know this book was written by aliens? Those who read this alien message believe it to be the truth because it is self-authenticating. No human could possess the depth of knowledge or the breadth of reasoning that this book portrays, it is impossible for human beings to know the origin of the universe, the history of this world, and all of the incidentals and personalities in the universe. This book gives that to us in a rare and magnificent word structure that no human could ever possibly produce. And my answer to that question, which I get asked that on a regular basis, is how do you know? Uh, how was it written? What is its origin? Uh, the, basically, the answer that I always give them is read it and base it on its fruits. Jesus himself said, by their fruits, you shall know them. So when you read this message, judge it based on what you see and how it makes you feel. It is so, a message of love. It teaches us that the Divine Father is a, is a God of love, a God of spirit. And we are to do his will, and if we do, we get the greatest treasure ever offered to any human being, eternal life, the fearlessness of death. Come with us on this voyage. It's <laughs> Janet, an adventure. Janet, I hope that answered your question. Uh, we will now go to line two. Lois on line two, uh, welcome to What's Really Happening. Hi, guys. My question has to do with the 570 body changes we make before facing God. Does the message say what the afterlife is like? Boy, Lois, that's a, that's a typical question we get on a regular basis. That was the first area of concern with me, uh, was what happens after death. And boy, does this message really paint an elaborate picture on what happens to us and where we're headed to after this, uh, after this planet, life on this planet. Elaborate a little bit on that. We die here, or shall we say, uh, just go to sleep in our first step toward eternal life. And when we awaken... We awaken on the first mansion worlds. Uh, Jesus and the scriptures talked about them. In my father's house, there are many mansions. Well, these are the seven mansion worlds, the educational spheres where we really hone down and perfect our personalities uh, after dying. Now, when we wake up in those resurrection halls, we are greeted by our guardian angel, and we really begin there just as we left off here, just with a new body. We have the same memory banks. Uh, we have the same experiences, and, and so we're really essentially the same person with a different body and as soon as we wake up the guardian angels there uh, lead us to the registry halls where we may consult the registry to find out if any of our former colleagues on earth uh, are actually there and if they are we may call upon them we get a 10-day period of visitation relaxation enjoyment uh, the natural environment there is uh, superb most of the prophets thought that the mansion worlds were heaven Oh, they're so far from heaven, it's not even close. But to the contrasting differential was so great between such a barbaric restaurant-like planet Earth where everything's eating each other, everything's living and dying, to go to a planet where there's even no rain, there's no waste excrement. Uh, in other words, physical evolution is more perfect there. You don't have this extra stuff uh, where we, that we have here to deal with. So it's a really exhilarating experience. And if our, if our personality has advanced past the teachings of the first mansion world, after those 10 days, they just send us on to the second mansion world. Uh, it's sort of like skipping a grade if you're real smart right. when you're in grammar school or, or something like social uh, progression. You Ultimately know. gravitate to the level where you left off. And I think that's the most important thing of this message is saying that you will pick up at the next life exactly where you left off so that puts an extra import on your job here and your perfection that you're working on on this planet is to try to, to get to the highest level you possibly can while you're here. When it gets down to the lowest common denominator it is a school all of reality is a school uh, and the main lesson in the school is superb self-control and that means doing the will of the Father controlling your actions and your thoughts toward 
the doing of the will of the Father. And that is success in the universe, and that will get you the ticket to eternal life. Don't have anything to add to that. We uh, have got a break here. We'll be back. We've got time for one more question after the break, and we'll take a break and be back with that question right after this. And we're back. Welcome back to What's Really Happening. I'm Todd. And I'm Joseph. And, Joseph, we have time for one more call. We'll take it here. Uh, Paul from Alabama, welcome to What's Really Happening. Hey, Joseph and Todd, I've been listening to your show, and I have a, I have a question for you. I really enjoy your show, and I figure maybe you can help me out with this. Uh, it's about angels. Do, in, do, do guardian angels really guard us? Uh, in addition to that, also, I also would like to know, what do they look like? Well, I'll handle that one. Uh, that's a great one, because that's what everybody wants to know. Uh, guardian angels really can guard us, but most of their activities are centered around leading us into situations where we can exhibit our ability to do the will of the Father. They are the stage setters of our life. What we think are coincidences as we travel through life are the work of our angels trying to prod us into perfecting our personality and doing the will of God. Now, they are, the aliens say that they are capable of moving things in a destiny situation where your personal destiny would be at stake and if you were a vital link in the universal plan, yes, they would save you. But by dedicating your will to the Heavenly Father, uh, there's a great bonus involved in that. You get personal angels. You get two personal angels, personal seraphic guardians that travel and protect you through life. If you don't dedicate your will to the Heavenly Father, you, are just, you have a, a, just a pair of angels for every thousand human beings. To answer the question, what they look like? Well, the prophets thought they had wings because what they saw looked like wings. But uh, angels are, are transport creatures. They can, they can traverse the universes of time and space, and they do that with the help of their friction shields. And at great distances, these friction shields, which envelop the cargo, human beings or whatever they're toting around, protect the cargo from, uh, from being burned up as they enter one atmosphere to another. Incidentally, if you've ever wondered why there's so many seeming uh, extraterrestrial craft that we witness on Earth all the time, uh, we happen to be the divisional headquarters of the archangels in our whole universe. So uh, there's a lot of landing and taking off here, and these illuminated balls of fire uh, can sometimes be seen by the naked eye. And just to add and wrap up basically on the thought that you touched on earlier in your discourse there, Joseph, on angels, uh, is the fact of the prodding issue. You brought up that they prod you, uh, they adjust you. That's the one thing that this message constantly states is that the higher orders of intelligence do not control you. They do not force you to do anything. You have free will. They ultimately have to submit themselves to your will, what you decide in your life. But they always work uh, on a regular basis to try to adjust your thinking and prod you into the area, into the right path, as opposed to going down the wrong path. So that's basically one of their main roles in life is to do that. So we're out of time, folks. We're going to have to uh, break for this session of what's really happening. We really appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, join us next week. We're going to be discussing Jesus. And this message has a part four, or actually the, the last part of this message. It contains an eyewitness account of Jesus' life and his teachings. We're going to be discussing that on next week's show. So join us then uh, on uh, that show and find out more about what Jesus was why he was here, and where he came from. So, Joseph, I enjoyed uh, the episode with you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Join us again then on What's Really Happening. May the forces of truth, beauty, and goodness be with you. Okay.